Voting. Okay, it says we're live. I see the little live button. That's good. I now I have to wait for it to catch up so I can mute my YouTube browser. Oh, same. I have my YouTube on as well. Oh, I think everybody sees us. I see in the comments. Okay. That's good. Same, I, I have my YouTube on. Oh. Okay, I got us. I see us. Sweet. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Um, for those of you that have been joining along all day, this is a part of the AuthorTube virtual retreats. We are going to be talking all things world building. Um, it's going to be pretty casual. We're going to be entering, interacting a lot with the comments and asking you guys questions and answering questions. And this is Keelan Rivers. Do you want to talk about yourself a little bit? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Keelan. I am a fantasy and sci-fi author, fantasy published, sci-fi hopefully soon to be published. Um, and I also have a YouTube channel on AuthorTube and yeah, love world building. So. Okay, sorry. I'm like looking for the comments and I don't see the comments rolling in on StreamYard. That's problematic. Oh, that is problematic. I also don't see them coming in. Hmm. Okay. Well, I see them on YouTube, so that might just be what we're working with. Oh, for oh. some, it says it's a private. I see my thing says YouTube doesn't support comments on a private videos, but I don't think you Does had it? your videos private. I could see it. Huh. We love tough like technical difficulties. Okay. Well. That's fine. We can just watch the YouTube comments, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I just wish I could like highlight them and pull them up is the only thing. But you do what you can. So, all right, everybody was just saying hello. Lots of people are here. Um, I really like. I almost started clicking on them on YouTube, and I know they're not going to do anything. Do you want to like maybe sp maybe if you go into the video settings? I'm not sure. If anyone in the chat knows how to fix this, let me know. Okay. Yeah, that's so odd. You can restart the stream. Says Richard. Is that where I just like end it and then start it again? That seems... No clue. Maybe we, if we both leave the studio and then come back in. Trust me, I've left. Oh, well, I don't want to say that this is going to work and then it not work. But I've left my studio before by accident, by accidentally clicking the back button and it came back up. Okay. Do we want to sure. try? Everybody hang with us. We're going to try something really quickly. Sure. Let's do okay. it. Okay. Fingers crossed it works. <laughs> I still don't see them. I'm also hoping Keelan comes back. Okay, so I just saw Let's Write Some Stuff ask if this is going to have any word sprints in it. No, it is not. This is mostly just going to be talking about world building. And then um, Hugh Wardy is having a... That's so weird. It didn't work for me. Um, and then Keywordy is having live writing sprints right now. And it, her link, their link is down in the comments below if you want to go over to that to do some sprints. Um, someone asked about if we were doing sprints. So I was just explaining that. Still have no idea to, how to make comments show up. So fun. All right. Well, I guess I will start with just talking a little bit about world building and kind of a world building intro, if you will. Um, when we're learning to write stories, we were taught that there are multiple traits of which are like plot and character and setting. And I believe that setting is kind of like a simplified version of world building. When you world build, it's like what actually roots your character in, in the world that makes it feel real. Um, and world building is the process of creating a world that feels lifelike. So 
that's what we are going to be talking about today, all the various aspects of it. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is that kind of when you're starting to world build, it seems like there are two more. Um, primary methods to, and that is top down and bottom up. Um, are you familiar with this, Keelan? Yep. Okay. Well, for those that aren't, um, I actually like looked up these terms the other day because like logically I knew they existed and then I didn't know that there were actually terms for them. But top down first determines broad characteristics and develops each of those with greater detail. And bottom up begins with a smaller detail or part of the world and builds it up from there. Um, and so the first, well, okay. So the book that I'm currently writing was I started with a detail and then I tried to like zoom out and build a world around it. So I like started with a really small detail and then like went like zoomed way out and then tried to focus back in if that makes sense. So I kind of mixed the two because I was trying to think about which of these I was more like mm -hmm. what do you think you are i think so i think it's hard to say um a little bit from my end i think i have a little bit of both because i always tend to start i because i write fantasy with them with the magic system which i think is kind of a key part of like world building mm -hmm. however i normally start off with a global view of the magic system versus just like one detail. So mm -hmm. even though magic, if you're writing fantasy, is kind of just one part of the whole world building spectrum, um, I feel like it, it might still be a little bit top down for me because I, I generally start with the global view of the magic system and then sort it out. But that's, that's where I'm at. So I think I'm a little bit in between, maybe a little bit more top down and then I figure out the details. Okay, that makes sense. Sorry, I just started getting feedback all of a sudden and was like panicked. That makes sense. We want to know from you guys in the comments if you guys are bottom up or top down. Um, still wish that I could click on comments, but I can't. I can I can have the comments up and I can narrate the comments if you want. <laughs> if you want to. Um, World of Writing says I do top down. DL Stewart also does top down. World of writing starts with a concept and then zooms in in pieces. I think oh. I'm a little bit like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Ooh, Sarah did bottom up. I'd like to hear more about that because I'd just like to hear more about it. <laughs> it's so like interesting because I know that logically to make more sense out of writing, I should do the top down. But like, I definitely enjoy the bottom up where it's like, oh, I like this, like one super bizarre idea about something in the world. And then I'm like, okay, but like, why does that matter? Mm -hmm. And then I try to like elaborate on that. And that's how I come up with a plot most of the time. So what's the like, what is it typically about a world that like catches your attention then? Um. Well, in this one, it was Magic and Dragons, which is... I mean, I'm not, I shouldn't say this one. It's like in every book I try to write, it's always magic and dragons and mind control. Um, so there was something about like the mind control aspect of someone trying to control a dragon essentially, which is like a huge theme in like one of my favorite books growing up. And then the book has completely gone away from that and you can't even see that anymore, but that's where the concept started. And now we are like way on the opposite side. So the magic in short. Wow, okay. Um, RP said that he never actually world builds. I think setting slash world is my weakest attribute as a writer and so really interesting to hear you talk. Huh. So if you don't world build, how do you anchor your characters in the story? That's my question for him. I um, do know, I, I mean, I think it'd be interesting to hear from other folks as well, because I do know a lot of people struggle with world building. And I think, mm -hmm. Sarah, for you and I, it sounds like it's kind of one of the first things, at least for me, it's one of the first things that might even trigger a story. Oh, so, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
It's so interesting hearing about people's different processes. Yeah, it's kind of hard on a topic like this where like everybody has something so different. Mm -hmm. Um, we can talk about the different like aspects of world building and then like elaborate on those like different things that you can world build with, if that makes sense. Um, so when world building, it seems like I like to think of it almost as a snowball when you're like starting the story, you have to like give your readers like a learning curve with like the snowball that's like starting to roll down the hill because otherwise people are going to get lost and like your world building isn't going to make any sense. But there are two like main kinds of world building that you can do or can use. Both are important, but they're separate. Um, and that's physical setting and cultural setting. Um, I think that was articulated when I watched like one of Brandon Sanderson's world building like seminars because um, he's absolutely fantastic. And he's on YouTube. <laughs> he is on YouTube. That's where I watched him. Um, I'm still trying to like watch through his entire lecture series, but I'm not done with it yet. Um, but like within each of those, there are various things that you can world build. And so for physical setting, there's flora and fauna, there's the weather, there's geography, there's geology, the sciences, laws of physics. Um, if your story has magic, then like what are the rules of magic? Like what limits magic basically? And then like what can't be achieved by magic? Um, and cosmology, which is like one of my favorite things mm -hmm. in books, um, which is hard because that's something that I'm struggling with right now is I have to come up with the cosmology and like weave it in. That's what I'm stuck on right now. So do you have any that you want to add to that list or do you think that that covers pretty generally? I think that covers pretty generally. I, um, it's generally kind of the physical and cultural settings are pretty much to like, I, I personally tend to have like four main buckets of things that I use when it comes to world building. And that's one of them. Mm -hmm. Um, and also just like the laws of the universe in general. And I feel like, like you said, um, from the presentation that you watched, like clearly part of it, like it, it doesn't have to just be for fantasy and sci-fi. Like that's mm -hmm. one aspect of it. But like you said, you have to think about the flora and the fauna and the culture and all of these different things. So I think a lot of the time, I mean, my takeaway from this is like a lot of the time when we think of world building, it's, we think of it in a fantasy and sci-fi context, yet it's for everything. You kind of have to go through these steps no matter what story you're writing. It might take a lot less time depending on like if you're writing something that's in today's day and age, it might take a lot less time, but you still have to consider those things. So it's super interesting. Absolutely. I can imagine that it would be a little bit easier if you were writing like a contemporary something where you can like research and you don't have to come up with all of this from like almost scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just on the floor and fauna note, because you mentioned it, I needed mm -hmm. something to like poison, not poison, but like have certain effects on some of my characters in this, in my novel. And I literally spiraled trying to find a plant that could do this at the time period that my novel was based off of. And it was, yeah, it, you do have to go down the research rabbit hole. <laughs> did you find it though? I did. Yes, it exists. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Um, so I'm, we do have a lot of comments, so I want to read some of these really quick before yeah. I keep going down my rabbit trail. But Richard says, it sounds complicated, but it's not. But they have seven magical systems that overlap. I know that that's doable, but just as a writer, that seems overwhelming. So if you're doing it, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I'm a hard magic kind of gal, so like... I really like rules to my magic systems. And when I read, um, when I read soft and hybrid m magic as well, and we can get into these terms a little bit later or whatever, but like, I like rules. Basically, I like rules to my magic systems for me personally when I write. So mm -hmm. I can't imagine writing seven different rule books, basically, because I like basically write rule books. So that's a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's ridiculous. I do want to, have you read or watched Lord of the Rings? 
Oh yeah. Okay. I want to ask you questions about how you feel about their magic systems and stuff later. For sure. Um, Evangeline asks, has world building ever been tedious for you? I feel like that's a great question. Yes, it yeah. can be for sure. I mean, it's not always easy. Um, Kay says, I'm reworking the world building for my work in progress. Now the characters cross the whole continent. So I have to think of different, different ways the other countries say things. That's hard when you have to show a lot of different cultures. That's what I'm currently dealing with too, as I'm doing my edits. Um, let's see. DL Stewart says the culture and political schemes are what catches my attention when it comes to the world building as well as the history of the world. That is I something that politics. politics and history in books are huge. Like mm -hmm. I don't think like an origin story or something has to be explained, but there needs to be like shown that there was thought about that. Does that make sense? That's how I stand on it. Definitely. I agree. I actually like come up with there's wars that have happened 300 years ago before my book. And I know every single detail of it and it barely comes through in the novel, barely, barely, barely. But like, it's, it, it's kind of that richness of the world that, that makes it real. And I feel like that's such, it was phrased really well, but I feel like world building is such an iceberg where you can only see like 10% of it. And the other 90% is underwater. And it was like all in the author's brain they were, when they were like writing it, but you don't actually get to see all of it. But I love I history. I totally agree. I totally yeah. agree. I mean, it's hard, especially when you spend so much time world building something, you want to show it all, but that doesn't mean it's necessary or should be in there. Um, let's see, I just lost my place. Author Amanda said, I'm not the best at world building from the beginning. I'm much better with characters in dialogue. Do you start with world building, Keelan, or do you start with characters? I start with world. Okay, me too. I, do. I, I tend to think there's kind of like three points where you can start a story, mm -hmm. character, world, and conflict. And mm -hmm. I generally, most of the time, start with world. I don't know. How about you? I Definitely start with world and then wait too long to get to the conflict. And so when I edit, I have to go back and like cut out like the first 20 pages. But you mean that's my process, so it works. Um, Zoe responded to that and said, I like world building and it is one of the first things I do, but it can be frustrating. I absolutely agree with that. I got a blank page. So Sarah, who was doing a live stream before this, says it depends on the story. If it's a wide setting, I go top down, but only where the plot takes me, otherwise I bottom up. Interesting. Um, author Amanda says, oh, like after they go through and do character, then they have to go back and add in the details of the world. RP said, I tend to have a setting, but it's always really basic. For example, there's a church they go they go to, but I won't necessarily describe it in a lot of detail or anything, just very basic set descriptions. Okay. So you have to do some world building to start out in order to do that, it sounds like, but then you just like go back in and add details is how I'm interpreting that. Um, Sarah HR92 asked, who was it that I just referenced? Um, Brandon Sanderson. And then you got a question about how you outline your magic system. Oh, it is very complex. <laughs> we could, I can, I can answer it. Um, I can answer it, but maybe, maybe a little bit later. Cause I could, I could talk about magic systems for a while. <laughs> I think that's great. I think we might have to devote some time for magic systems. Um, World of Writing said, oh, I have trouble with that snowball thing. It seems that most of my snowball picks up snow in chunks instead of every scene. I absolutely feel that. Ooh, and then someone, Evangeline, asked me, Sarah, when do you think DE will be ready for beta readers? Great question, trying to figure that out. Um, hopefully in like a month or two. I was making a list of potential beta readers last night though. So I'm thinking about it. 
Um, Shane Curdy, Sean Curdy said, I start with characters and establish the world through their site and POV. I don't outline or plan the world really, but I sketch out maps and stuff. Ooh, Keelan, do you draw maps? I, uh, yes, I love maps. I sketch them. I have the very first sketch of my map in my notebook, and then I did it on Incarnate. For Ooh. anyone who's not on Incarnate, it's awesome. And then I got a map commissioned for my novel. So yes, maps are my jam. <laughs> I, like, that's one of my pet peeves is that when a fantasy book or something doesn't have a map in it, I'm like, well, how am I supposed to understand what's going on? Like, I have to have that map. Yeah. Um, I will say, I will say though, I, my, I'm currently working on book two and I sent it to my developmental editor and she got back to me like two days after having it and asked for a digital copy of the map, which mm -hmm. she has a physical copy of book one and all that. And I was like, I think the map is super wonderful to orient yourself, but a reader should be able to orient themselves without the map. And when she yeah. asked me for it, I'm like, ooh, that's not a good sign. <laughs> Hopefully she includes that in her um, notes back to you about like, this yeah. is roughly when I asked you that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I saw on Pinterest a while ago, and I made a video about this, but I make my maps by dumping dry pasta on a sheet of paper and then like outlining it. And then deciding from there, like where cities and rivers and stuff fall and where mountains and stuff where like pasta overlaps. So people in the background are being loud. Sorry. Um, but yeah, map making is so much fun. I would do that full time if I could, honestly, I'm just not good enough to make it a full time gig. Maybe just like keep practicing. I'm sure you could. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I will. It's fun. I mean, I would definitely rather come up with like a rough draft of a map then have somebody have to make one from scratch for one of my books if that makes sense mm -hmm, mm -hmm. totally um, yeah i love maps okay maps are the best i mean it's, a, it's not topography what is map making like the science of it cartography Cartography, yeah. I was like, wait, topography sounds right, but no, that's yeah. It, yeah. It sounds, I think it's cartography. In another life, I would have been a cartographer. Um. Okay, we've had a couple people comment on Lord of the Rings is the next thing on their TBR list, and then someone else is reading the second book of the Lord of the Rings right now. I have actually never read them. I've only seen the movies. I'm so sorry. Um, RP said, I have an idea for a big high fantasy thing a while ago and never had any idea how to begin it. So this is great. Awesome. Well, feel free to ask us questions too if you want any help. We will cover more stuff, but I want to catch up on this. Haley says, I saw this guy who created three languages to give his world more life. I can't even fathom that. He must have been a linguist because that, that's so much work <laughs> to develop three entire languages. Okay, yikes. Yeah, there's lots of folks. I've seen um, lots of folks, like people who are language experts, like spend, create entire, entire languages for fictional worlds. And it's amazing with like conjugation and all these different things. It's brilliant. Which like, I get so irritated when I'm trying to learn a new language, but I would love to be a linguist. So I don't know if I'm going about it the wrong way or not, but another dream job for sure um world of writing says that they know way too much about their world's history that's, that's not really fun yeah that's that's great like it, that's not a bad thing so long as it all doesn't go in the book right as long as it's sprinkled in and not like dumped yeah um someone asked me alexandra asked me what kind of microphone i use um the speakers or the microphone or my MacBook. I have nothing plugged in, which is good. I'm glad that sounds good. Um, Sarah said, I do the most basic history ever and tend to world build only when I know, only what I know will come into the novel itself through plot or character. Interesting. And then at Keelan Rivers, the world build. Okay. Ooh, you have a fan. Kay said, at Keelan Rivers, the world building and magic system in all the King's traders had stuck with me. Honestly, it's so good. Thanks, Kay. Um, 
Yeah, Kay read and reviewed um, all the King's Traders, and I, it's very nice that you are letting me know that the magic system is great. It's got to be. <laughs> and Kay and I have met, and Kay, have, Kay and I have met in person, which is really fun. That's awesome. Um, DL Stewart says, I have over 7,000 years of history for my world, but I plan on writing so many stories in the world that I'll probably eventually use most of what I come up with at some point. Honestly, that's smart. If you're going to do that much work in coming up with 7,000 years of history, you might as well really milk it. How much history did you have to come up with your book, Keelan? My book is set 1,114 years after this event that happened. So so my novel is a fantasy novel, but it's set mm -hmm. in a post-apocalyptic future. So 1,114 years before um, before the my novel, we were living life on Earth, chilling just like we are now. So my answer is 1,114 years. That's how much history. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I am working currently with about 800 years. Um, I know what happened 800 years ago, but I'm trying to figure out exactly what happened between point A and point B. But things are falling together, which is good. Richard asks or said, sometimes you have different regions and how a region has affected the character can be difficult. I think they were responding to someone else. Huanu says, my fantasy novel has a magic system, but it is so weak. Any tips on strengthening the overall world and magic system? We will get to that in a little bit. Life of Angelina says, I'm currently planning on making a history book and spell book for my story. That's cool. Okay, when you say that you're currently planning on making a history book and a spell book, is that to be referenced within the book or do you plan on like, publishing those separately. I'm not entirely sure how to read that. RP said, yeah, that's exactly right. It tends to be real basic, but I often go back and add more detail later. But my main issue is I just can't remember all the details of the world. Do you keep um, a world building Bible, Keelan, when you're world building, like with all the notes in it? I do not. Okay. Um, however, I keep a character sheet a um so i keep a character sheet with all of the different characters and their wants needs goals etc um their personalities what they look like but also their abilities for magic mm -hmm. um and then i do a really detailed outline of each scene and then i do have general notes about like distances and such but the magic system's pretty solid in my head um mm -hmm. So I do have a lot of different things, but I wouldn't necessarily say like the magic system in the world is pretty solid in my head and it's sprinkled throughout all of these things versus having something solely dedicated for world building. However, if it's something that you struggle with, I would highly suggest it. Do you have a world building Bible? I know a lot of people do. I have a notes document that is like probably like 98 pages long with notes on everything in my book. But the issue is that it's everything in the series, not everything in the book. Mm, yeah. So, but is it like pot points with world building throughout or is it? Um, like you can, so I have like, I think there's like 60 numbered things in it. And so it, you can, so basically I've tried to make it really easy for myself so that I can like search in the little search bar mm, for yeah. like religion and then it'll take me to the religion portion and it will like have everything about the religion. Yeah. So like it's kind of a story Bible. It's also sort of, it's not an outline, but it contains all my ideas, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, RP said, okay, I, don't remember what he said last time, but he said, yeah, that's exactly right. It tends to be real basic, but I often go back and add more detail later. But my main issue is I just can't remember. Oh, I already read that one. Whoops. <laughs> okay. Um, Angela popped in and said, hey, just popped in, but I love world building, even though my story takes place in the real world. Creating rich towns in contemporary novels is highly underrated. It is highly underrated. 
but I'm sure that you're going to do a lovely job at it because it is so important in any kind of writing. Yes. Also, heck yes, Angela. That is, I completely agree with the creating like, like world building. I think in novels that aren't fantasy and sci-fi seems to lack attention and it's, it's a real thing for sure. Also, Sarah, you're crushing it with reading these comments. I love it. That's good. I'm like highlighting it with my cursor so that I don't lose my place. I'm also on YouTube going through them. <laughs> if you want to jump in at any point and read a few, just let me know. Yeah, no, you can you can keep going. You're doing great. I love it. <laughs> and you are hosting a stream after this, so. True. <laughs> um, DL Stewart says, I'm in the process of creating 11, I'm sorry, 12 languages for his world. Each consisting of over 3,000 root words. It takes up a lot of my time in my world building currently. They are writing 12 languages. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> so much. So I copped out on my languages. I'm going to be 100% um, honest with you guys. Mm -hmm. And I basically, because this is in a futuristic world and there's very few people left um, in my novel, they speak a language that is not the language the reader is reading because they reference back to the like ancient humans languages, which is us. So people like it, it's interpreted that the book and that the characters are talking in now this new futuristic or I guess post-apocalyptic universal language because I did not want to come up with languages on my own. That's fair. It's, uh, I can't imagine doing that. I haven't even tried though, honestly. Um, Jasmine asked if you can do a video on your magic system. And I believe she asked earlier if you can do a video on your magic system, Keelan. So there's a video idea. Yeah, sure. I, I, people have requested my magic system before and I, it's just so big and complex and I haven't figured out a way to like succinctly explain it, which is why I can go on and on and on forever about it. But I have the general kind of like main points. <laughs> um, I mean, you should still make a video about it because I'd love to watch it. Um, Evangeline says, do you, hi yikes. Do you find it hard naming your characters in high fantasy? Sometimes I'm scared, I'm scared to give my characters normal names. If you're writing 1,114 years in the future, do you find it hard coming up with names? They have all sorts of strange names pulled from all sorts of different... I, I was like, I'm going to take inspiration from this kind of age and era. And that flew out the window super quick because there's three different kind of main countries in the book that I'm writing. Mm -hmm. um, so some folks have, I, I think the only suggestion that I would make for high fantasy is that a lot of people when reading high fantasy are intimidated by very complex names. And all the King's Traders have people who have complex names and it's hard to pronounce, um, but I tried to limit that as best as I could while still having the fantasy vibe, if that makes sense. Like, I feel like there's a fantasy vibe for names, um, but I would definitely say, don't be scared of giving your characters normal names. But if you're basing the, if you're basing your high fantasy after a certain time period or after a certain like era, try and align the names with what would be suited for that particular era. Um, and then it, it's just kind of broad, general, whatever you want to do. Just don't go like super overboard on the epic high fantasy names because it can get a lot. <laughs> it can become a lot for the reader. I totally agree with that. Um, I saw a funny comment. I want to say it was on Pinterest about how to come up with fantasy names and you basically like put a bunch of Oreos in your mouth and then you say normal names and then you just write out how they come out. And honestly, I tried it. I cannot remember what I came up with, but it was so good. Like you nailed it. <laughs> like I was very impressed with that. And I definitely will need to do that again. You is should what I'm video doing that coming up with my fantasy names. With I'll do it just for you. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Um, D.L. Stewart says that they love drawing maps. Tracy said that they love cartography. Life of Angelina said that she'll commission us to make her maps. Oh, gosh, no, you don't want me. Take Sarah. 
It'd just be so fun. Um, Chris in the writer says, now the map song from Dora is in my head. I can't remember how that goes and I'm really grateful for that right now. Um, Huanu at Keenan was just rehashing what world building is. So writers create their own governments, money systems, society, law, et cetera, et cetera, so that they can have a new world. Um, okay, Richard said to typography is about text. Not sure why that came up. Oh, I think maybe mixing it up with topography, which is about like lens. Oh, right. Thank you for correcting me, Richard. Um, I just didn't catch up soon enough. Um, Keenan said that they feel like they know nothing about their worlds, but like that's part of it. That's why you world build. We can do some questions later to help you work on that. Um, I have a couple pulled so that I'm curious about. World of Writing said, I had stuff from 1,000 years ago, but then stuff from 500 years ago, and then I skipped to when the book takes place. That sounds fantastic. Life of Angelina says the history and spell book are for world building, so they won't be published separately. I would just help me know more about the world and will be referenced to school books. That's really cool. That um, is super cool. One of the coolest like writing experiences I had, or like one of the most surreal writing experiences I had was writing like, I mean, I wrote eight pages of what have, would have been found in like a history book in my character's world. Not all eight pages were used, but like that was so cool to me to like actually write that out and be like, this is something that my character is gonna read. Mm -hmm. Just a very like out of body experience. Those are, and I'm, oh, I can't even imagine because you put yourself in your character's shoes like entirely. That's crazy. But I like, I think those are the things, like those are the little things that can create such a rich world. Even if it doesn't go in your novel, it's, it's the pieces that have happened in the past or the things that the world is kind of moving towards in the future that you know mm -hmm. that will influence your writing throughout. So I think mm -hmm. that's super cool. World of Writing said, I have all my stuff in one notebook for this book. And then I also wrote an explanatory chapter for a camp, which I use for reference. That's really smart. Kimberly at Life of Angelina, you could add them to a members page on your website for the readers to, to have if they want to know more. That's actually a really good idea to have like extra bonus info for readers. Um, she said, that's a good idea. RP said, I've heard of people putting together a world Bible, but I just don't know where to start with it. Do I make a map, then start a document about one city, and from that, a document about a district, etc.? I don't know how to answer that. Um, if you, I mean, it's all up to you, really, RP, if you want a world Bible or not. It all depends on, like, if you feel like you need one, I think. Yeah, I think it all depends if you, like you said, if you need one. And you can just sort it based on like, okay, this is the setting. These are the governments. This is the magic system. Um, and then just type the notes that way. Mm -hmm. And I've heard um, actually from Victoria Scott that your character sheet and world building Bible. She doesn't believe in a Bible, but she does believe in like, you should have like one to two pages of information so that you're not like digging through something to find it for like when you need it. So try to keep it as brief as possible, but also not missing anything basically. Mm -hmm. So try not to ramble during it. Um, Richard said for their larger story, they do keep a Scrivener wiki slash story Bible file. Makes a lot of sense. Um, Shane Curdy asked, how do you incorporate real-time errors with a completely made up world? Do you wanna try and answer that one? So like today's era? Um, so I'm interpreting this question like there is a world that is not earth where this story is taking place, not saying it's a space story or anything like that, just saying it's like totally, totally different from our world and times and eras. I think, I mean, if you want to incorporate 
like I feel like anything you incorporate in another world is going to be a reflection of what's happening on our world because we can only imagine so much, right? So everything's going to take inspiration. I just think, again, I'm a hard magic. I'm a hard sci-fi kind of person. I like rules. So this might not apply to everyone. But I think if you're going to pull from different eras and times and and basically take ideas from different parts of our world to make a new world, they just have to make sense together. Like you, you don't want to have a te- you don't want to have a society in a world that is super extremely far advanced with like floating cars and such. And then another society that is medieval, unless there's a reason for that in that particular world. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So I think you can pull from any particular time era, um, any particular technology you want to make this made up world. It's just the creative part to me comes with how you like intertwine everything together and basically make it make sense. That was very well put. Um, Yeah, I feel like if there is something that you like from the real world and you want to add it to your fantasy world or fictional world of of some kind, all you have to do is like research whatever you're doing and then make sure that it's, um, I mean, yeah, just research and then whatever you want to add. Yeah, basically take whatever you want. It's just make sure they all all the pieces work together. That's a that's the important part for sure. Um, World of Writing says I don't have different languages because I'm lazy and my book is in a small portion of one continent, and the people have only been separated for a hundred or so years. Um, and then a question for Keelan: How far in the future would you have to go before it would be hard to understand the language? Do you know about the devolution of languages? No. Okay. I was just, I was hoping to get insight because I'm trying to write a sci-fi. No, but I, I, like, I I don't know what that is, but I do know um, language changes and evolves. And basically this world that I've written, again, it comes back to the just making it make sense. There there are people from the ancient time that like our time basically from all over, but there's very, very few of them left. And instead of, you know, everybody continuing on their different languages, they've just come up with a mishmash that is one language that has moved forward. And obviously the book books written in English because I'm, I'm like English and I speak English. Um, but you can only get hints of that very briefly in the book. Like when one of the characters is reading a book that has been res- pres- um, preserved from the ancient human era. He, they call them ancient humans. And he was like, I'm reading this book. And he was like, oh, thank goodness they've translated it to our language between the lines. So you, it's never explicitly stated. It's just that's how it was intertwined. But I mean, I think you can... they kind of collectively decided to change the language, right? So it depends if the language is just kind of devolving and disintegrating and and changing naturally, it might take a long time. But if collectively the people decide, hey, we're going to speak one dialect, then maybe it happens a lot quicker. That sounds really cool. I like how you summed it up in like one sentence in your book about like, how the languages have changed or like that they have changed and acknowledged it, but without like diving into like, Oh, here's how this word changed. I think that's really brilliant. I'm sure most people wouldn't even notice it. Like I'm sure most people who've read all the King's traders probably don't probably just assume all the characters are talking English, but probably like, like, yeah. Um, DL Stewart says, I like all of my characters to have names that can at least be attempted to be pronounced. That's fair. Attempted to be pronounced. I agree. People can, should at least not be intimidated. <laughs> like yeah. they can try it and then get it wrong. Sure. But yes. Um, and even like simple names can be pre- like pronounced incorrectly. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, the writing said that two of my main characters have short basic names, but I really feel like, but I really feel like they fit their vibe. So I'm okay with it. Awesome. Well, then that works. Um, I got a blank page said just for the, I just referenced different languages. They spoke this country's language instead of actually creating the language. That's a great way around it too. Um, and then two people 
said, I would love a video of you doing that, talking to me, but I'm not sure. That's the Oreo video. Oh gosh. Yeah, you do it. <laughs> I want to, but I'm like, that would be so embarrassing to put online. Oh, yikes. We'll see. We'll see. Um, and then somebody typed out the map song from Dora, which I'm not going to read because I don't want to put that in my head. Um, DL Stewart back at Sarah said, I do not, I do that most of the time in the story, but there are many times that someone speaks in a different language and the POV character doesn't know what is being said. So I just use the other language. So in that case, I'm curious about how the reader can understand if it's in a different language. I would love for them to get back to me on that. Um, RP said, I have a real bad habit for that, Sarah. I'll write in a lot of books that my characters read that don't exist or they are writers themselves. That's really funny. So I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Um, Sarah back to DL Stewart says, writers who create languages amaze me. I would just type they spoke in blank language. Absolutely. World of Writing said, oh yes, I do want to do a story Bible, but I don't know how. If anyone does, you should make a video on it. Um, the end is within sight here. We're almost to the end of the comments. Veronica said, I'm currently writing a historical fantasy, I'm sorry, historical fiction fantasy romance story. And I basically used 1600 France, but just changed the name to different names and reference France as a guide. Interesting. Um, World of Writing said they want to make a story Bible before they edit so they can um, fix consistency errors. Um, Richard says, look towards Patrick Rothfuss. Where are our Martin, Neil Gaiman, and J.K. Rowling as an inspiration for world building? Uh, Neil Gaiman is, yeah. Have you watched his um, masterclass? I have not, but I get the ads all the time. I want okay. to. It's very good. I highly recommend. Um, I'm still watching it, though, so I'm not done. Zara said that she's hopping in late and we'll have to hop out again soon, but I'll definitely come back and watch it in its entirety. Um, I just came up with a language for my series over the last three days. Wow, cool. Um, someone mentioned that Brittany Wang has a story Bible template. Mm. I will have to look into that. Um, Kristen said the names shouldn't be all too much alike either. That frustrates me as a reader since I get confused. So I have a problem with names that sound familiar. When I was writing the book that I wrote in high school, like I think it was seven out of 10 named characters because it was a rough draft had names that started with like a hard K sound. And I still struggle with that because those are the names that I really enjoy are like, cause they're, I don't know, they're like the best ones to say. Oh yeah. So I get stuck on those names. Do you have a weakness for any particular names? or kinds of names, Keelan? I just noticed that I've rewritten my second draft, like I've rewritten my second fantasy novel that's coming out this summer, like multiple times. And I only noticed, I even think I did a poll on Instagram that two of my main female protagonists both had names that started with A and kind of sounded very similar. And so I did a poll and I asked, and I'm like, guys, are these too close? Cause I generally try and avoid names that have the same um, first letter for my protagonists at least. And everyone voted that I was too close. And I'm like, I knew it. I was just like, so attached to the name at that point, but I came mm -hmm. up with another one that I love even more. So it's fine. But yeah, I struggle with it. And I didn't even notice. I wrote the whole thing, the whole like first fast draft, which is now pretty much all scrapped, but um, I wrote the whole thing and didn't notice. And it wasn't until I was editing where I was like, oh, crap. That's really funny. Yeah. Are they like super similar other than just being A names or is it because they're both A names? No, they're not. They're both A names. They're both AU names actually. And then they were oh. not, they were just together for a lot of the book. And I was like, no, this, this is not going to work. If they were very different A names, that might work. But if they were both AU names, then that, yeah. Yeah. It's it really fun. interesting. 
Okay. So we talked a little bit about like world building, like a physical setting. And now I want to talk like briefly just run over some categories for like a cultural setting. And those things include um, economy, laws, religion, politics, and government, landmarks or wonders of the world, the caste systems, the customs, the philosophy, the food lore. Um, and then I actually found a really fun quote from Margaret, Margaret Atwood that says, I like to wonder what people would have for breakfast, which people as their breakfasts would be different and where they would get those food items and whether or not they would say a prayer over them and how they would pay for them and what they would wear during the meal. And if cooked, how was it cooked? And she said, breakfast can take you quite far, which I think is really cool, but I do not get that deep into food when I am writing. Um, but that is basically, a, I mean, that's kind of how you world build is you just start asking all of those questions within these various areas. Um, so more are music, fashion, languages, cursings, blessings, swearing, um, which brings me to the secret word of this live stream, which um, can you, I think you could explain it a little better. Can you explain the concept of the secret words? Oh yeah, us? sure. So um, for the author tube virtual retreat, we have secret words in every single one of the sessions. And so Sarah is about to say the secret word, drum roll. And then at the end of all the sessions or whenever you end the sessions, um, there is a link in the description box below to a feedback form for the AuthorTube retreat. And it's just generally about whether you like the retreat or not and stuff like that. And also if you want to be a presenter in a future retreat, you can also put that in there. Okay, can you guys still see her? Did she freeze or did I freeze? Uh-oh. I just unadded her and then added her back. It looks like she might be having some issues. Uh-oh. Okay, well, basically at the end of the... Hello. Keelan froze. Keelan did freeze. Okay, cool. You guys can still hear and see me. That's really encouraging. Um, well, then I will take over from what she was saying, but basically there is a feedback form down in the description that basically um, we're going to ask you guys to fill out when you're done watching the streams and stuff. If you, I mean, choose to ultimately, sorry, also trying to figure out what's going on, but um Wow, that majorly derailed me. Each of the streams has had a secret word and will continue having a secret word. And then at the end of May, four winners will be chosen to receive $15 Amazon gift cards. And so all you have to do for chances to win those are by entering the secret words and reviewing on the survey linked down below. I wanna say it's towards the end. Oh no, it's towards the top. It's like the third thing linked. Um, and then, yeah, each of those secret words will be an entry for you to win these gift cards. Oh no. Oh no. Okay. So her internet crashed apparently. It's writing. Uh oh, come back. Then, um, cool. Well, then I'll keep talking, but basically because we are talking about the various aspects of world building and some of the important things in world building or that could be chosen to be important in world building are like languages, um, phrases that are used, curses and blessings. And so therefore the sacred word of this sprint is indeed curses. So everybody write that down so that you can fill out that survey later on or that sheet, I'm not totally sure what it is. Um, oh, the form, the Google form, I believe. So, Zara had to leave. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, okay, what did Richard say? 
they've been talking back and forth, so I'm not entirely sure. World of Writing said, can we enter the secret words and say we don't want the gift card? I don't want anything mailed to me, but the secret words are so much fun to collect. I'm sure they, I'm sure that you can just add that to, um, like, in the forms. I'm sure you can just add that. And like a comment where you're listing them, I'm sure at the end of it, you can just be like, this was just for fun. Don't send me the gift card and you'd be fine. Yeah, I put the secret word on the screen right here. Um, cool. Well, I guess we will attempt to just try and continue this while she's not here with me. I'm going to check Instagram to make sure she hasn't DM'd me. Okay, Evangeline just joined us again. She's experiencing technical difficulties. Okay, she has not. So, yeah, she froze her internet went down, but she'll be back. I hopefully. Um, Richard asked, "How far in the future would you have to go before it would be hard to understand the language?" That's something really interesting. I have not looked that up yet. I think that that's a relatively easy question to look up. I mean, if you watch The 100, which is technically like 100 years from now, things have started devolving, but that's also a YA dystopian and can be argued about whether the show was written well or not. Have not read the books. Um, but basically, picking up after mentioning languages, cursings, blessings, there are weapons and technology, there's the history, there's the folklore, and also mythology. Um, you can deal with human rights, prejudices, education, laws of war, courtship, architecture, jobs. Um, jobs would be really interesting in like a fantasy world because you can like think about what kinds of jobs would not exist in our world, but exist in those worlds and like why would they exist? Oh, she's back. Hi. My internet fully crashed. I just just had to text Rogers to give me high speed internet on my phone so that I could do this. <laughs> wow. Well, welcome back. Thanks. I'm sorry. All the That's technical okay. difficulties, eh? Always. <laughs> and always when we're trying to stream. And only yeah. Um, yeah. So I just, I finished talking about the secret word. The secret word is curses again. Um, and then finished talking about some more potential aspects for um, world building, if you want to do like cultural world building, which I think mm -hmm. is important. Um, I think Keelan said this earlier and she focuses on about four different things, like major yeah. things. And yeah. I've heard like between like three and four is like the sweet spot. Um, so I think the ones that I'm currently focusing on my book are religion, relationships, and magic. Yeah, I think those are my three. I mean, there are like other things. I'm probably doing way too much with like cosmology and stuff, but that kind of fits in with the religion. And so I'm like letting it slide. But and if it's fun, like it gets you to keep going, right? So I mean, that's the whole point anyways. So yeah. can you easily put into a couple words which ones you focus on? Or is that yeah, no. So I, so I've kind of got like my method for world world building is I focus on like four larger categories, but my, my four kind of items that I focus on the most, actually, I'll start with the larger category. So I start on the rules of the universe. And that includes like everything from magic to like, any kind of physical rule or limitation. And then I've got history and politics that I group together setting and style, which is probably my not like my, my worst category, I guess. Um, and then I also like to consider what I want the world to be in the future. Mm -hmm. But my four kind of things that I focus on the most are magic system, religion, history, and politics. Those are my like, biggest four when I'm writing. And I feel like, yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. Seems like a very good array. Um, I am kind of curious if the people, I lost my, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, I am curious from like that list or what you guys in the chat 
use or focus on for world building. Um, so if you guys want to let us know, that would be lovely. Um, I did mention one of the things I mentioned to Keelan was jobs. And so um, the world of writing said they do have a lot of jobs in their world, not enough, but a lot. And then they said, yeah, you're back to you. And then you were getting a lot of welcome backs. Um, Thanks, everyone. It was, uh, it was dark and lonely without you guys. Um, okay, World of Writing also looked up. Someone else asked, how far in the future would you have to go before um, it would be hard to understand the language? And World of Writing said that they looked it up and it would take between 500 and 1,000 years to evolve. Uh, which is cool. I did not know that. Um, Dania asked what our favorite magic systems are. Ooh, okay. Do you want to talk about magic systems? <laughs> yeah, let's switch. Um, I, I don't know. Is, is there more? We can do more on the on world building and then get into magic systems. Up to you. I'm kind of ready to talk about magic systems. Magic systems are lovely. It's just such a big, like, massive thing. Um, do you want to start with, like, hard and soft magic systems? Sure. Do you mind going through that? Yeah, sure, sure. So, so in my in my mind, at least, there's three different types of magic systems. And you can take this to sci-fi, too, because there's hard sci-fi and soft sci-fi. And the way I see it is a hard magic system is anything that has very specific rules that it uses um, and basically how it affects that particular magic system. So you can almost think of it, and I'm sorry I'm going to like pull science and math into this, but you can almost think of it like a physics system, basically. There is rules and structure to the magic system, and things don't go outside of those rules and structural bounds. And that is a very hard magic system. Um, in, uh, well, you know what, I'll get to that <laughs> in a second. Um, a soft magic system is exactly the opposite. So it's normally vague and undefined, and it normally has a more fantastical feel to it. Um, meaning that like anything is possible and there's like fairies that can do whatever it may be and vampires that can do X and Y and Z, but there's not really a hard limit. So, um, it's, it's very undefined basically, and it does feel very fantastical and you can go outside of what would normally be the limits of a hard magic system. Now a hybrid, and I think the perfect example of a hybrid is Harry Potter is where there are some rules, but there's still fantastical elements. So Harry Potter, there are spells and you have to know the spells. And when you say the spells, you know what the spells are going to do. But there's all of these other fantastical elements that still remain undefined. For example, um, like there's dragons and we don't really know the extent of the dragon's powers and there's trolls. And sometimes folks can use magic without their wands and there's not really strict rules on that in particular, or sorry, not without their wands, without saying a spell. So that is kind of how I view a hybrid magic system is the mix between the hard kind of almost physics like rules and a soft, fantastical, anything is possible type magic system. Mm -hmm. I am a hard magic system lover. I like writing it. I like reading it. I don't know about you, Sarah. How do you feel? <laughs> um, I'm going to add really quick to what you were talking about yeah. with explaining the two. Um, I feel like there can be a lot of rules, like an author or the person coming up with the story can have a lot of rules for their magic system and not include them. And then that would make it a softer magic. And so it's mm -hmm. as much information as like included, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I totally agree with that. Like the author might know the extent of people's powers, but if it's not included, it starts leaning softer to the softer side for sure. Definitely. Um, I am definitely like a 75% hard magic kind of person. Um, I do like a bit of the wonder aspect and I don't, push it all the way to being a science, but I do have um, like consequences when magic are used. There are side effects to magic being used. Like the way that someone attains magic is very specific. So mm -hmm. 
I'd say like 75% hard magic. Like there's a predictability and a consistency because that normally leans hard magic. There's the hybrid is a huge space in between, like huge space. <laughs> right. So I'm hybrid leaning towards hard magic, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. I thought you froze for a second again. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just, yeah, no. I um, I definitely lean towards hard magic. And there is, because this particular book is set, or like the series that I'm working on is set further in the future. Um, it is high fantasy, guys. It is very much a high fantasy, but it is set in the future. And it because it is on our earth, there were limitations. So that's why I chose to go the hard magic route. And I think you kind of have to, when you're determining whether you want to use a hard or soft magic system, and sometimes it just happens. Sometimes it just flows, but you have to kind of consider it in the context of your larger world. Absolutely. Um, okay. There are a lot of comments coming through. And so I'm trying to figure out what is being talked about. Um, cases that names are a huge part of their world building. They also think of different ways to say things like swear words or common phrases, which is really smart. Um, I would have to say though, this is just like a perf like personal thing when I was reading the Maze Runner series. I did not, it got really annoying how much they used the word clunk for like, um, like an alternative for the S word really, really bugged me because they just used it all the time because it was like getting away with swearing in the book. And I understand that it's a bunch of like essentially untamed teenagers. So of course they would, but I don't know, just reading it, that really started bugging me. But I think that that's cool to come up with different ways to say swear words and common phrases. Um, Kristen said they'll be writing a cozy mystery probably in modern day America, but it'll be a fictional town. When I took AP world history, we focused on five things, social, political interactions, cultural and economics. And it's known as the spice themes, which I have not heard about. That's cool. Nor have I, but that sounds like a great place to start any type of series Bible or world building. Yeah, definitely. That sounds like it covers like the main gist. For sure. Um, World of Writing says magic systems with an exclamation point. Um, Zoe said that one of their favorite magic systems is in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Have you read that? Oh, FMA is a FMA is a um, the manga, a manga. Oh, okay. manga. I know, don't Not know how I, I'm pretty sure that's what it is, but I haven't read the manga, but I've watched the um, anime. So there's an anime and it is great. And Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, because there's a few different um, Full Metal Alchemists and Brotherhood is the superior one. Just throwing it out there. So noted. Okay. World of Writing says that mine was a hard magic system, but then I changed it to a soft magic system because I didn't define all the rules. And because the MC breaks the magic system with no reason. Interesting. DL Stewart says that their magic system has just a couple rules only. I'm going to try and pronounce these words. Um, Dins and lynches can do all magic while other races are only capable of doing certain things. Um, DL Stewart also said, also my magic can't be used on any living thing and it drains the user of stamina and can limit their magic use because they become tired. That makes sense. So magical consequences. Yeah, I think magical consequences and Sarah, you mentioned that before, they're super important because otherwise, mm -hmm. I, I think they're important in any magic system to be totally honest, because otherwise it would just be chaos. <laughs> Um, so it's not like super well-defined, but in the Witcher, the, yeah. have you watched it? I have. Yeah. Okay. I love when they're, um, when one of the girls is like learning magic, I love like those magical consequences. Yes. I think that that was done really, really well. I agree. Um, I also feel like, 
Okay, so what I wanted to talk about with Lord of the Rings earlier was um, I feel like Lord of the Rings has hard magic and soft magic, and soft magic would be like, I want to say Dumbledore, but I know that's Harry Potter. Gandalf. Thank you so much. For some reason, they were just like switching. Um, Gandalf, like his powers are not explained. Um, No. But he's just powerful. So therefore, he is like super soft magic. But then like the ring is hard magic because we like, well, not entirely, but like we know that if it gets back to Sauron, it's bad. If we like the more that Frodo wears it, like he starts feeling the side effects and then he sees what happens to it if you like wear it too much and give in to it. So that's like hard magic because like all of those things are defined, which I think is really cool to show both sides of it. Um, I mean, they're two different magics, but. No, it's super interesting. Like I really like hybrid magic systems. And when you can see like there's a fantastical element, but there's also something that's like very defined. And normally the thing, mm-hmm or at least what I find, like in the example of Lord of the Rings and in the example of Harry Potter, the thing that is very defined is tends to be the more centric point of the magic system. Like Lord of the Rings is focused on destroying the ring and like Harry Potter is focused on the spells and the magic school and everything else just kind of adds these like more fantastical elements. Mm -hmm. Um, Because soft magic doesn't mean there's like sure there's stories that have absolutely no rules at like whatsoever like i think a pretty good example of um softer magic is like the chronicles of narnia where Mm -hmm. everything is just fantastical but there still are like there's still inklings of rules here and there that you can get so Mm -hmm. yeah i couldn't explain to you how the magic works in narnia but like it does and it feels satisfying Mm mm-hmm which makes me know that it was like really well done because like, I don't need all the rules to be happy with it. Um, World of writing says, I'm trying to make my magic system a little bit harder and harder as I go by adding rules and stuff with my edits. Um, and then Alley Cat asked as for the secret word because they're not sure if they missed that or not. I will flash it up here on the screen again um, when we were talking about languages. And so therefore the secret word is curses. Um, I don't want to drop off the stream again, so I'm not going to say anything. (laughs) (laughs) You don't want to jinx it? No. (laughs) Um, Jasmine asked if we would ever research voodoo magic. Oh, yeah, I would definitely. I research, if my magic, which it currently is not, is based in any sort of, like, existing or, like, culturally historic magic system, I would research it. But I go down the research rabbit hole like mad. Do you do that in your outlining phase? I do that in my drafting phase, which is probably because I generally pants a first draft and then Mm -hmm. go back and outline. So yeah, I'm like not, (laughs) not the I feel bad admitting it, but I normally do it in my drafting. But however, if I were to be a a hardcore plotter, I would probably do it in my outlining phase. But like my drafting, my first draft, my zero draft is kind of just like an outline, to be totally honest. So a very, 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 very detailed outline. That makes sense. Um, Zoe agrees with you that the Brotherhood is better. Um, Evangeline says, how do you balance having so many ideas for amazing world building and then not bombarding the reader with too much? I think this Um, goes back to your three to four points. Three to four points. And then I also wanted to make a comment about info dumping um, because I know that I have struggled with that in the past for sure. Um, But that a scene should only include as much world building as there is character development. Um, I've never heard that one before. That's great. Thank you. But it also makes sense. So it totally makes sense. um, And then world building should be shown actively um, instead of like just like paragraphs at a time. I really like when I'm reading a book, the world building that I love reading is like when there's like dialogue happening or when there's like something going on in the scene that can then show the world building. Mm hmm. 
And just in terms of the world building and like magic systems and all that, a really great mechanism that a lot of books use, and maybe it's getting a little bit overused, but it's it, it, it really works and it still resonates with me, is the mentor-mentee scene. Like there's normally in fantasy books, not normally, but sometimes in fantasy books, sometimes in sci-fi books, there's a mentor type figure sometimes in any books, there's a mentor type figure and there's a mentee type figure. And I feel like a lot of kind of explanation can happen in those scenes without it feeling like explicit info dumping when you're having a mentor mentee interaction, because people expect the mentee to be learning from the mentor. So you can kind of slip world building nuggets in those scenes when those characters are interacting. That's really smart. That makes a lot of sense. Um, do you want to talk about how you build your magic systems? Oof. That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, you don't have to, but... Yeah, no, I think it's a good question. Uh, how do you build your magic systems? <laughs> we, can, we can trade off, I guess. But I guess my magic systems are generally rooted in science. I have a science background. So I try and think of something that could realistically happen and then extrapolate it into a magic system. And I know some people don't like magic systems that are rooted in science, um, but that is generally the point at which I start. So for this particular, like for all the King's traders, I'll give you an example. Um, there is the whole idea of it came from there is in science, like there's matter and then there's antimatter. Like that's a fact, like it's a thing. Um, so I was thinking, well, what if there's energy, but there's also like an anti-energy that has the energy to absorb. And okay. that's where my inspiration came from. And essentially that's where I started my magic system. Like what if something instead of emitting energy had that power to suck energy in and then contain it for it to be used later. So that's how it started. Wow. Okay. Um, so the way that my magic system started was I started thinking about like the different aspects of like the earth so like, I mean, so like the four elements basically, but I tried not to use those four and then I turned it into five basically, like subcategories for some of them, but basically five governing powers, mm -hmm. um, like gods would like rule over this world and they could interact, which I thought was interesting, but then there are two that do not. And then I figured out that like I wanted humans to be able to borrow from them not like demigods but like through a relic basically mm -hmm. um and sort of doing that as like wanting to help that ruling power keep everything in balance and so that is how I came up I mean so that is like what it is trying to talk in really loose terms though um and I don't remember how I came up with it though. Yeah, I feel like sometimes it just like, it just comes, you see something or you hear something and then the idea comes to you like partially or fully formed. Mm -hmm. um, and then like the real art and world building comes like to fleshing it out and putting the detail where it should be for the story and kind of refraining from putting the detail from where it shouldn't be in the story. Mm -hmm. um, Chris from the writer says that the Chronicles of Narnia um, do have a lot of really cool world building. Yeah, they do. Super cool. We're, sorry, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> That's not good. <clears throat> yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, Chronicles of Narnia has very, very cool world building. Um, it is just a soft magic system, but they've taken so many elements outside of that magic system and created such a detailed and vivid world. Like mm -hmm. the world building doesn't have to rely on, on your magic system basically. Oh yeah, absolutely. 
Um, Kristen agrees that you definitely shouldn't explain in chunks for sure. Um, readers will likely skim over and it'll take away from the plot, especially if it's tense, if it's a tense point in the book. I feel that I always skim when it, when I hit too much world building. Um, so in my own writing, I try to be really intentional about how much I add because I know that all in all, like simplicity is key Mm -hmm. and like simplicity and clarity. So yeah, and I think just on the simplicity and clarity point, like in terms of will, world building, you have to consider the story that it is you're writing. Like you're mm -hmm. like we both write fantasy, but if you're writing something that is like sci-fi that is maybe based in our world, like not a space opera, or if you're writing a contemporary, like there's a certain amount of world building you have to do and a certain amount of detail you have to go into. In a contemporary, for example, people are familiar with our world today. Mm -hmm. So you have to give off enough world building that you get the vibe that you want in the story and the feeling that you want and the sentiment and like the reader feels situated and familiar with everything. And like, let's say you want to go for a cozy feel, you get that cozy feel, but you don't have to like create things from strat scratch and include you have to include more in a fantasy so that people can get oriented in your world. That doesn't mean they're one's more difficult or less difficult than the other. It's just two different levels of detail that need to be included. Absolutely. Kind of going off of that, Evangeline asked, are you ever scared that some of the extensive world building you come up with that you love will never make it into the book? I'm going to answer that with, I'm glad I'm writing a series because then more will likely come up. I am going to agree with that because a lot of the stuff that didn't come up in book one for me came up in book two. And I was like, oh, thank goodness we can explain this here. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and like just I so I started planning my book that I'm currently working on. Um, I started planning that by trying to write the entire series first and then trying to figure out where the first book fell. Um, which is the part that I'm currently working on. But in doing that, in order to get all of the world building into it that I want to, it has to be a series because it has to like, everything that I want to include happens over like a certain span of time. Mm -hmm. And so it just worked out very beautifully for me to work it and make it a series. It's also way too long to make it a single book. So um. Susan from Nar Alexandra says that Susan from Narnia teaches us you can show and tell people things and have shared experiences, but there will still be people that refuse to believe no matter what. This is often not addressed in the novels. That's interesting. Um, DL Stewart says that about 95% of their world building is done through the dialogue. I love world building done through dialogue, personally. <laughs> can you give me an example by chance? Like, can you, can you know um, how to explain that better? Yeah. So I guess like you can have narration, right? Where people are walking through a setting and seeing things and whatnot. Um, but I like when characters are talking about an experience they have had or something that they're about to do that doesn't explicitly it's not explicitly about the world or the magic or the politics but you glean from their conversation what is happening in the world so mm -hmm. um instead of like saying instead of saying the you know i'm trying to come up with a like concrete example but instead of like talking about having the character reflect on maybe the like corrupt government or something like that maybe it's a conversation between two characters that are discussing how the election was rigged and then you just glean from that that you know there's a corrupt government and the world is is what it is and it's in a state of disarray instead of like having someone reflect on it and you could do it with setting too um it's a little bit harder to do especially because sometimes you want to have that description but i i do like uh when world building is done through dialogue like characters discussing items that help build up the world and the sentiment about the world Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I do kind of want to go into asking like general questions and engaging with the chat more about various world building questions. Are you cool with that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, awesome. 
Um, I think we're going to start with like an easy one. And that's like, what is the climate that most of your story takes place in? Um, honestly, my characters travel a lot. So mine have many, but most of the time it's winter and like kind of dry. For me personally, the climate varies depending on where they are. Mm -hmm. But the world is a very small world. So a lot of the cold versus hot has to do with elevation more so than um, like geographical location north south. So um, they go over a few different spots, start in the mountains, go through desert rainforest, et cetera. But mm -hmm. it's all spread out over the series in the books. Okay, interesting. Um, I don't, hang on. So Giovanna said, I'm writing a historical fiction and often find it hard to balance describing enough of the environment cruise ship that the reader has a good sense of the space but not bog down the story with them. And then this is the one that caught my eye, but Kay said the first line of dialogue in my work in progress is the warships have returned. So, you know, right away there's well a war in this world and that's such a great opening line. That is, yeah, love it. <laughs> it's a great way to like instantly hook someone. Um, Life of Angelina says that the main climate is fall for her work in progress. Alley Cat says, I need to do that more, write more with my characters talking and showing what's happening rather than tell it. I struggle with that a lot. Um, well, and then Life of Angelina said again, we'll fall into the winter solstice, which is the deadline. Um, Kristen, the writer asks, how do you decide on the names for your countries and towns? I do a lot of researching in other languages for words that I think I can attribute to the area, if that makes sense. Um, so if like a land is known for being peaceful, I'll look it up in other languages and then I'll tweak that other language word. Oh, Sarah, I think I do something similar too. What do you do? I, I, like I, I do that as well. Like uh, there's a character in my novel who, um, I deal with elemental magic, so she has the ability to like control air. And so I looked up like first names that mean that in other languages, and then kind of tweaked or like had that meaning historically. But I do the same things for countries and towns. Um, the names generally reflect what that place does. Mm -hmm. um, but also, my novel is pretty straightforward in terms of locations. Like they have an area called croplands, and it's where they grow crops so it's not even in a different language um but i think yeah you can think about one if you're drawing inspiration from like an era like mm -hmm. if or like a, a certain country like if you're drawing inspiration from like france use names that are more french mm -hmm. um but otherwise like yeah i think like you said sarah think about like what the town or city's purpose is and then go from there Mm -hmm. um, D.L. Stewart said mine would be all of them because my story takes place all over the course of a year or so, plus it takes place in different environments. So a little bit of everything. Um, Evangeline May says, I've watched so many author tubers worrying about how much of the book they have to cut out in later drafts or when a publisher picks it up. Is that something that wor worries you with long books? Um, my book is currently... 109,000 words. And so currently I'm not too worried about the length. If I need to cut it down by like 10,000 words, I'm not super worried about it. There are things that can be cut out. And ultimately I know that the goal is simplification so that readers read the whole thing and not like dropping off. So I personally am not too worried about that. I was absolutely devastated though when I had to cut out the first 60 pages of the last book I wrote. Um, like from, it was the, yeah, it was the beginning 60 pages. That was heart wrenching. And I like haven't touched it since I did that. So how do you feel about that Keelan? Or do you, you're an underwriter though, right? 
I am. I do cut out a lot though because I write, you know, you know what it is though? It's because I write a lot that is be that like means nothing because a lot of it is from my fast draft pantsing. Mm -hmm. So like I write a lot that gets cut like mm -hmm. really quickly. <laughs> um, but I am an underwriter. So in terms of having my log novel be too long, I'm also, I also self published. So I don't really have a limit. However, I want um, my novel to kind of fall within what is re normal for normal expectations. Um, and if you're writing high fantasy, like 109,000 words is totally, totally chill, like for fantasy. Um, but yeah, it doesn't worry me. It doesn't worry me too much. I, I try to keep it um, around 100,000, like 70 to 100,000 words. Um, because that is kind of reader expectation for what I'm writing, but mm -hmm. it it doesn't worry me too too much. Um, Zoe right or Zoe says, mine starts at the end of fall and goes into the depths of winter, so lots of snow. Um, I think it's time for another question. I like this one. Um, what is illegal? What is something that's illegal in your story or your world? Ooh, let's wait. Do you want to wait for uh, the comments to come in or do you want to go first? I'm honestly thinking, do you have one? Are you ready? Okay. But I can wait. I have to come And it's only in one country though. Okay. Three <laughs> but it's legal in the other ones? Yeah. Well, okay. no. It's just more intensely illegal than the other ones. <laughs> oh, love that. Yeah. And this. I like Maybe. laws. I think of, I, I definitely do think of laws. Um. So yeah, again, the question is, what's illegal in your world? Um, this is to y'all in the chat. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that one might have scared people. I don't see any coming in. So in this... Go oh, I see DL Stewart. I sorry, I just saw the comment come in. Okay, he said that the laws are basically the same as in our world, and so I assume that that means that like the same things are illegal. Were you going to say something, about Keelan? Oh, I was just going to go with my law that I immediately came to my mind. Okay, so in my world, in one of the countries, mm -hmm. unwarranted murder is illegal but warranted murder is totally fine and legit. So That's kind of fantastic. Yeah, unwarranted murder murder is illegal, but if someone, so there's no laws in this country, there's three laws in this country um, that are all punishable by death and unwarranted murder is one of them, but there's no laws about theft or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But if you cause harm to another, the murder is considered warranted and you won't be punished under their laws. So that's kind of what keeps everybody in check. So it's only unwarranted murder that's illegal. Interesting. Yeah, there it's a pirate world, so. I'd love to live there though, that sounds great. Um, DL Stewart says, so basically murder and theft are bad. And there's Life of Angelina says, I'm going to make a law slash rule book as well. That makes sense. Um, ooh, this one's interesting. Zoe writes, says, in one of my kingdoms, wasting water is illegal. My little environmental sustainability heart is so green right now. <laughs> that's like, that's awesome. I love that. Um, Alley Cat says my novel starts taking place in the fall and either close or to the start of winter. I was originally going to do spring, but we'll have to see. Um, G said it, that is so interesting. Like, I need to know more about that world. I'm pretty sure that was the wasting water one. 
And then DL Stewart says, I have a holiday in one of my lands that is kind of like the purge. They get a free day where there's no law or authority. Oof. Oh, I just got a chill. Nice. I can't wait to read that in your novel, DL Stewart, because I thought the purge was so underdone. I thought it was the coolest concept and they I didn't think they went deep enough into it. Yeah, I never watched it, but I heard that it got really poor ratings because they didn't do it as well as it should have been done. Yeah, because what a cool concept. I think so many people fell in love with the concept and then- Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, it's just, yeah. I think what they went for was more like a, I don't know, again, I didn't watch it, so maybe we should like talk on that, but I don't know. I would love, if that concept wasn't already used, I would like love to take that concept and run with it. Yeah. Um, just because they did not do very well. Um, I also really like this one is, so the next question we're going to do is how big is the gap between rich and poor in your world? That's a great question. Oh, I just read in Kay's comment. That's so funny. Not so much illegal, but dishonoring and disrespecting the main character's hair is very frowned upon. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, I don't think I said mine for that. No, I don't think you did. What is it? Um. Well, obviously there are like obvious things that are illegal well maybe not obvious but like frowned upon um but something that is illegal is there's a kind of fabric that can stifle magic and that is like highly illegal because i also don't know how it's made so that's fun i have to figure that out but it's that kind of fabric and the selling of that fabric and that is highly illegal. I don't know how illegal, but highly illegal. Um, Zoe so says, what? That sounds super cool. I hope so. Zoe says, it isn't necessarily illegal, but teleportation is restricted when they teleport to different kingdoms. That's cool. I mean, that makes sense. You don't just like want someone teleporting inside the castle or something assuming it's a castle because you did use the word kingdom. Um, Deal Stewart says, uh-oh, hang on, I missed a few. Ooh, okay. Life of Angelina says, oh, for the story I'm world building right now, eating meat slash killing animals is illegal. I love that. I don't want to be the person that's like, well, I'm going to do it anyways, apparently. Um, that makes my like vegan heart very happy. I'm like, yay, we're saving the animals, even though they're fictional. Um, Kristen, the writer says, mine will be a cozy mystery. So I guess that murder is illegal, question mark, LOL. Um, and then Shane Curdy said, question, how do you, how do you incorporate word, rules into the world? Kind of struggled with this still. That's a great question have people break them and then get in trouble for it. That's true. I, yeah, that's true. And then also like if they get away with it, then that shows that the rule isn't that tight. Mm -hmm. And so, or if they have to try really hard to get away with it, that can be something. Um, it's also one of the, again, like, does this rule, is this rule something that just you need to know or does the reader have to know it? Like you have to consider that too. Um, Dale Stewart says, it's not in my book yet, but there's a celebration to the end of winter. I feel that um, my book is something similar where it's the end of, or it's the beginning of spring. Um, Kay says not so much illegal. Oh, we talked about that one, the main character's hair. Um, and then DL Stewart says it's briefly mentioned before because someone kills someone on the day and mocks the holiday for the reasoning of why they killed them on that day. Interesting. Well, that's a good 
way to introduce it then. Um, and the deal Stewart also says, I have a kingdom that if you commit a serious crime, they brand your face five times so that you can't hide your crime, your crime later in life. That is intense. Ooh, I love that. They did that. Uh, I love that. Not that exactly, but they, they, I've seen something done similar, mm -hmm. obviously not exactly that, but it, yeah, it was great when I saw it executed. So I'm really excited for DL Stewart's story now. <laughs> Um, G said that she's really, or that they're really enjoying all of the answers to the illegal question. Zoe says, it depends on the part of the world. In my main character's kingdom, there's a divide, but the people are well taken care of because magic provides an abundance of resources. Um, Jasmine asked how y'all got into the magic system, but I'm not really sure what that means. Alley Cat says, one of my short stories has a government sort of government, but different, if that makes sense. Right now we have asteroids falling from the sky, so that's fun. <laughs> There's safe houses for people. It sounds like fun. Um, oh, and then Life of Angelina says that they're also a vegetarian, so pretty much all my characters end up being vegetarian as well. That's really funny. I actually wrote like a super graphic scene of like a tiger ripping into a goat the other day. Um, which is very bizarre. I was also watching Tiger King, so maybe that's part of it. <laughs> Just, you know, very vegan friendly things apparently. Um, wow, let's write some stuff. Says so this is really random, but it's almost 1 a.m. right now. That's oh crazy. God. Thank that's you for crazy. being here. That's nuts. Like also go to bed, but like, thank you for being here. Um, and then DL Stewart says, in my world, his peasants get paid 2,500 bellies per month, and then the king gets almost 35 million. Oh, the difference between, okay, rich and poor. I'm assuming that's the currency. Um, Veronica says, honestly, I got some ideas for magic from the last Airbender TV show, oops. And then D.L. Stewart says, oh, thanks, it's a tribal kingdom based heavily on Native American cultures. These all sound so cool. Huh, oh no. <laughs> So he says now all I can picture is Joe Exotic as a fantasy main character. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> That's funny. Um, he would he is a fantasy main character, let's be honest. He's not he real. Is. No. Um, 100 percent no, not. <laughs> not at all. Um, so I have not fixed the description of this video to send people over to now your live right in keelan do you want to oh yeah um there was a last minute change in the schedule so we had a uh cancellation so the 8 p.m live stream is going to be over on my channel for anyone who's not at one in the morning <laughs> um yes perfect and then dale stewart about the belly says yeah that's my currency it's called bellies because the base currency is made from the stomach of a turtle like creature that's awesome. That's well thought out. That's crazy. That must be, that's a lot of turtles. Um, yeah, so basically we are almost at time. And so Keelan is going to drop her live writing sprints in the, or the one that's coming up that starts at the top of the hour. So in 15 minutes in the, probably the chat box, and then I'll copy it and try to add it to the description here um, so that people that are watching this later can hop over to that one next. But um, if you guys need a reminder, this is the secret word for this live stream. Um, live streams have been going on all day about all different kinds of topics with the author two virtual retreats. If you missed any of them, they will be staying up on YouTube. So feel free to go back and watch those whenever. And then Four winners will be chosen at the end of May um, through the Google form. Yeah. Okay. In the description, um, four winners will be chosen for $15 Amazon gift cards. And yeah, the it's pretty much, I believe there's three more things. Keelan's live write-in, and then we have um, that starts at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and then at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we have The Right Mama talking about killing it at Pitmad, which I definitely need to watch. 
And then at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we have the closing keynote with Savannah G. Goins. And so all of these links are both down below and on the AuthorTube virtual retweets um, YouTube page. That's what I was trying to say. And so, yeah. I think I said everything I need to. Yeah, nailed it. I was like, I don't even remember this. My brain's so all over the place now. That was That's such right. a... I, it, I always love talking about world building and hearing what other people are doing. And I think this was just like such a fun discussion to hear what everybody in the comments is doing as well. And like, yeah, learn from one another, right? Yeah, I really enjoyed that. I didn't really want to do like a seminar with the PowerPoint and stuff. I wanted this to be engaging. And so I really enjoyed how that turned out. Thank you for everybody who came and participated. Yeah, uh, and Sarah, like even without the comments, like I... At, like we had a few technical difficulties and girl, you crushed it. Everybody give Sarah a like for reading all those comments out loud instead of putting them on the screen. Cause that's not easy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then I'm going to say this to people who are hopefully watching this stream later on, but if you are watching this stream later, feel free to answer these questions in the comments still below too, because we still want to know your answers, even though you weren't here with us live. Um, yeah because this is going to be staying up. So thank you so much for everybody for joining us. Okay, let's write some stuff. Ask what the time is in Eastern Standard Time now. It's 7.48 and Keelan's stream starts in 12 minutes. Yeah, cool. Other people answered her too. Um, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I will see you over on Keelan's channel here in just a second. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>